Hi everyone, uh, this is uh, Jack from Singapore. Uh, thanks for attending this uh, event. Uh, this is the Asia Pacific Society of Cardiology webinar hosted by APSC and endorsed by IICP. And we have faculty and very esteemed faculty in cardiology and ID uh, across the region to share experiences. And um, our guest speaker today will be Dr. Zhou Ning from uh, Wuhan, China. So he is, um, <clears throat> uh, I, I heard a star cardiologist, up and coming rising cardiologist, one of the star young cardiologists from China. And uh, he led the front fight against COVID, treating his cardiology patients as well. He's from the Dongji Hospital, uh, Hua Chong University of Science and Technology. And I managed to dig this slide out, uh, Dr. Zhou Ning, I wonder whether that's you. This was publicized in the Chinese uh, news, uh, heroism, uh, well explained by the Chinese medical workers. Uh, Prof. Uh, Zhou Ning was one of those that got infected while I was working and seeing this group of patients very, very early. And uh, his viral, his, sorry, his uh, tips and tricks on how to recover from COVID went viral, I heard. And uh, that's him in uh, this uh, particular report. So he's going to share with us not just his experience in treating patients, but how to get well if you get COVID. Uh, Professor Koji Nezagawa is from Kyoto, Japan. And uh, he's our next esteemed faculty uh, from uh, representing both APSE as well as ICP. He's an uh, immediate past president for ICP and is, as you can see, he's a very esteemed professor representing a lot of boards across the region. Dr. Ling is a senior consultant uh, ID position at NCID. NCID, uh, for those who are not in Singapore and not aware, is our National Center for Infectious Disease. This is really the epicenter treatment um, uh, center for Singapore. And she leads the ICU uh, uh, team in treating uh, infectious disease at Tano Singh Hospital as well. And um, this NCID was actually built out of the fear and the need that we saw post SARS in 2003. So Singapore, like China and Hong Kong had SARS. And this new building was built because we we're expecting the next pandemic. Dr. Lam Ho is a good friend of mine. We have known each other for many years, an interventional cardiologist from Hong Kong. Um, and uh, he's very active, always doing crazy stuff in the cath lab. But uh, recently he shares with me that he's very interested in doing all these educational forums uh, through webinars. And I'm doing one more. I just did one with him the other day on the transcontinental COVID CBM sharing. I'm doing one more with him tomorrow again, I think, on complication sharing, if I'm not wrong. So, um, Oh, sorry, next month. And, um, and that's for introduction. I'm going to stop my sharing of the slides. There is a Q&A. So uh, feel free to enter your Q&A. We're going to group this question. And we're going to take a quick Q&A after Dr. Zhou Ning's presentation, uh, followed by Dr. Ling's presentation, then a summary uh, Q&A. We'll try to address as many of your queries as possible. Uh, tell us what you think uh, we are. We are calling for feedback and uh, there will be a feedback form that will pop up and uh, your feedback will help us structure the next series of webinar that we think will be useful across the region. Last but not least, I'd like to thank uh, Roche uh, as a sponsor for uh, helping coordinating the logistic for some of this uh, event and for pushing for this uh, education forum to continue. So I'd like to thank Roche uh, for kindly uh, sponsoring this event and gathering uh, our stakeholders across the region. So without uh, much more ado, uh, we'll get uh, Professor Zhou Ning to start sharing the slides. Thanks. Okay, it's my time? Good. Yeah. Okay. So you can share your slides now. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Chen, for your uh, nice work. So uh, I would like to share my screen first. So can you see it? Okay. Uh, as mentioned by Dr. Tan, so I'm a cardiologist from Wuhan, uh, Tongji Hospital. And uh, yeah, he just mentioned that I was infected in the very beginning of this outbreak of COVID-19. Uh, actually, that's a very sad story. I don't want to mention it. <laughs> but fortunately, I survived. And uh, yeah, and uh, after I uh, get a two weeks <coughs> quarantine, um, and then I return to the uh, ward of the COVID-19 patient. So. Uh, it's my great honor to be here and uh, to share some experience 
is bad or is good. So I've shared it with uh, these outstanding colleagues from all over the world. So the title of my topic is the clinical characteristics and the management of the COVID-19 patient, especially first on the management of the uh, very severe uh, COVID-19 patient. So this is my self-introduction. And uh, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, introduce my hospital. My hospital is Tongji Hospital in Wuhan city. So it was founded since 1900 by a German doctor. And uh, we have three campers and over 60,000 beds and uh, 10,000 medical personnel working in my hospital. And we have 62 clinical departments. And also it's a rank of the top 10 hospital in China. So what I work, uh, where I work is these cameras is optical, optic uh, body cameras. So it uh, have uh, 1,000 beds in these cameras. And uh, recently it was designated as a exclusive hospital for the COVID-19 patient, especially for the severe COVID-19 patient. So I have been working here for over two months. And uh, yeah, Wuhan may be not so famous as Tokyo, as uh, New York, as other very big city in the world. Uh, but now I think it's very famous because it was the uh, epicenter of China of uh, COVID-19. Actually, Wuhan is located in the very center of China. So it has a population over 12 million. And uh, because it's very center, so it's a, a commuter area of China. Due to the outbreak of COVID-19, it was locked down in, on January 23. And uh, we're so happy to share this news with you that our city was lived the lockdown on April 8, just uh, one week ago. So far, uh, there are more than 83,000 uh, accumulated uh, cases in China. And uh, unfortunately, we have over 3,000 deaths so far. Uh, most of the cases came from Wuhan city. Uh, we have over 2,500 uh, deaths. Uh, in the uh, epidemic of the COVID-19. And uh, I would like to share with another uh, bad news with you that we have a lot of medical staff that was infected in the outbreak of this COVID-19 epidemic. And unfortunately, 61 medical personnel died in the, uh, passed away in the uh, epidemic. It accounts to uh, the mortality rate of the medical personnel is around 2%. That's a great loss of Chinese medicine. And uh, this is uh, a clinical characteristics of the COVID-19 mission in China. It was published in January, uh, in the very beginning of the, uh, in the very early stage of the epidemic. Someone said that the, COVID, the coronavirus only infected the elder. That's not true, as you know. Uh, from this chart, we can see that people uh, aged from zero to very old, like 65 years old, they're all very, uh, susceptible to be infected by the coronavirus, and uh, especially for those uh, for those uh, pre people aged from 15 to 65, they account for the uh, biggest proportion of the infected patient, and uh, male uh, account for a majority of the infected patient, and the median incubation incubation time is around four days, and uh, uh, most common symptom of the patient is fever and the body temperature was not so high. It's only 37 to 39. And uh, most of the patients have a dry cough. Also, have some, have some, some of them have the sputum. Uh, for those who have a shortness of breath, that's not a good sign. That means it, might, it has a very high possibility to develop into a severe or critical severe type. Also, uh, most, uh, Around four, uh, one fourth patient have a coexisting disorder. For our cardiologist, we are very interested in the patient with uh, diabetes, hypertension, and chronic heart disease. Uh, this is a very early, early data. They found that uh, around 50% of patients have hypertension in the COVID 19 patient. But according to our observation, because I worked in the uh, ICU world of the COVID 19, I found that around 48% of the patient with a severe COVID-19 patient has a, co a coexisting hypertension. And around 14 patients have a coronary heart disease. Uh, I mean, just for the uh, very severe COVID-19 patient. So that's very high. 
there's a very high proportion. And also the complications include the LDS and the pneumonia. Most of the patients have a, a, a symptom or signs of pneumonia is account for 91%. And this, this death rate actually is very, is early stage, in the early stage, so it's only 1.4. Actually in China, uh, so far the mortality rate of the uh, very general COVID-19 patient is around four to 5%. Uh, percent. But for the very severe patient, uh, the mortality rate is much higher than this. So these two videos show that uh, uh, a very typical change is of the radiological, uh, radiological uh, uh, characteristic of the severe COVID-19 patient. Look, the, the long BM is very significant. And this is another summary of the report from uh, published in uh, February, uh, including more cases, uh, around 72,000 cases. So the person aged from 30 to 90 account for the most majority of the uh, infected person. And 81% uh, of them are mild. Uh, unfortunately, around 20% of the patients will develop into severe or critically severe patient. For those severe cases or critical severe cases, the mortality rate is extremely high, it's around half, half. That means half of the patient will die after the infection of COVID-19 if they are a critically severe type. And for those very old, the mortality rate is also very high, it's around 50%. Uh, so this is a, a report of the health, uh, health, uh, health personnel infected ra uh, ratio is around 3.8% uh, of, of the patient, of the uh, medical, health, medical health doctors and 63% uh, of the medical doctors and nurses uh, uh, who was confirmed uh, infected by COVID-19 uh, who was working in Wuhan because in the very early stage, we don't know what the pathogen, uh, what the, I mean, well, what the, uh, the, the origin of the, of the infectious disease is. And we even don't know how infectious the virus are. So at that time, we don't have enough PPE and we get a lot of medical personnel was in, were infected at that time. And 48% uh, uh, of these infected medical personnel are classified as a severe or critical severe type. And, uh, 61 uh, deaths. So this is a, uh, a matter of great concern from our cardiologist. So for those non-survived, this, this was published in JAMA uh, in uh, March and in March. So for those non-survival patients with uh, COVID-19, their hypertension is account for 48%. Uh, the diabetes is 31 and the coronary heart disease is 24% in they are not in the um, deceased COVID-19 patient. That's very, very consistent with our observation in the ICU ward in my hospital. And if the patient have a very high troponin, that means is a, uh, the patient has a, have a myocardial injury. So in this case, the mortality rate is, is very, very high. So 46% of the non-survivor has a positive um, troponin. And uh, we conclude that there are some clinical characteristics of the severe and the critically severe patient with COVID-19. The first one is the distance. That means around 20% of patient is severe type. And then it's a high mortality. 60% of the patient, that means the severe patient will die. And uh, in the patient, in, in the, in the, for those severe or very crit critical severe patient, they, most of them have a multiple organ injury. So, uh, Dr. Cho, I think we're losing you a little bit there on the internet. What? Uh, pardon? Yeah. So you can you can continue again. Just now there was a. Uh, oh, it's stable connected. Okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, so for the management and the control of the epidemic in China, the first step is test to find out the source of infection. That's the most most important. So we need a lot of virus test kit to find out this infected pa uh, patient. Secondly, secondly, the isolation. To isolate all of the confirmed cases, all the very highly suspected cases, 
uh, cases to isolate them to cut off the path of infection. So uh, below I provide a link to uh, uh, to help you to find out the, the experience and the guideline, uh, guideline in China we followed to uh, management uh, for the management and uh, the treatment of the COVID-19 patient. It was published by the China National Health Commission. And for the treatment, uh, as you know, we don't have very specific and uh, very uh, confirmed effective antiviral drugs to fight against the coronavirus. So most of the treatment are general uh, treatment, including the rest and monitoring and the oxygen therapy. And of, because in China, we have a lot of mild type uh, COVID-19 patients. So we, we give them some traditional Chinese medicine. And uh, this is the um, antiviral drugs we use in the uh, world. Uh, but we, so far, we don't have very solid and uh, very, uh, very solid, very strong evidence to show that some of the antiviral drugs is very, very effective for the uh, coronavirus. So for those who develop into a very severe uh, COVID-19, what should we do? Most of the uh, most the most used uh, and I mean most common used uh, method is to uh, support the mechanical ventilation for this kind of patient. But what if the patient still have a very severe hypoxemia on ventilation? So we don't have many choices, right? And uh, uh, some of the patient was uh, needed the monitoring and the management in the ICU ward. In the ICU, uh, that's what I, well, that's where I worked in the hospital. So. For the treatment of the severe patient, we need the respiratory support, uh, including long invasive and invasive ventilation, and also the immunotherapy like a systemic steroid and the blood purification, circulation support, and finally we need the ECMO support. So I would like to share. Uh, very, uh, we'll go through very quickly for a, a very critically ill case. So this patient, this patient is 50 years old. is male, Mr. C, uh, admitted on the Feb 11, uh, uh, 2020. So the chief complaint of this patient is fever for 11 days and short of breath for two days. So see, uh, this is a physical examination of this patient. It uh, shows that uh, uh, the SpO2 is very low. That's a very dangerous condition. And uh, the coronavirus, uh, he, he get a very uh, positive coronavirus uh, test. So this is a CT scan image uh, video of this patient. It looks like the lung region is very, very bad. And the lab test showed he has a very low lymph side proportion. So as you know, the lymph side proportion is a very strong biomarker uh, for the outcomes and uh, the prognosis of the patient with COVID-19. If, if the lymph side is very low, that means the outcome of this patient is not good. So be very, very careful about this kind of patient. And also we find a very low uh, a very uh, increase, a, ver a very increased anti pro BMP. That means uh, that's a biomarker of heart failure and a high tripoli, and that means the patient have a myocardial injury. Also, the ejection fraction is very low for this patient. So that means this patient have a, a, compli a complication of heart failure and a heart uh, injury. But we give some very general treatment for him, but the hypoxemia getting worse and worse. This is X-ray just took two days before he was transferring to ICU. So we give some, we give some additional treatment in ICU for this patient, including the uh, intubation and the ventilation, and also the prone position ventilation to help him to overcome the, uh, the hypoxemia. But his oxygenation index is still very low. It's only 95 milligrams. So, you know, as as a normal or healthy person, uh, his, uh, his oxygenation index should be higher than 300 or 400 milligrams, but his is only 95. It's a very dangerous condition. And also, uh, the ABG showed is a very low pH, low PO2, and uh, low SpO2. So, uh, we don't have much choice for the, for the treatment of this patient. So, after a very uh, comprehensive discussion, we decided to do the uh, implementation of an ECMO for him. So uh, that's uh, Feb, uh, Feb 18, and this picture, the left one, the picture just took a couple minutes after we finished the implement implementation of ECMO bedside. And the right is uh, uh, shows that S his SPO2 went up very quickly after the implementation of ECMO. So this is the initial parameters of the ECMO. And uh, during the uh, 
treatment and monitor, monitoring in the ICU is getting much better. So here shows the ABG shows that uh, his PO2 is goes up very quickly and uh, he get a uh, after the treatment of the uh, in the ICU, his coronavirus test shows a negative result for three times, and the total antibody for COVID-19 is positive. So these two CT scans showed uh, before the implementation of ECMO and uh, two days after uh, one days after the win off of the ECMO, shows that his lung lesion getting much better. And uh, we re remove the ECMO at, on February 27. And so this picture shows that he's uh, re uh, re regained his conscience and uh, he says uh, uh, he looks very healthy here. Look, he was discharged in March 20. He can talk, uh, he can walk, he can do something that the healthy people can do. So we are very happy and so proud for, for him. And this is summary of this case. We give the antiviral drugs, the biotics, and the steroid. And this is the duration he stay in the ICU. And uh, this is the invasive ventilation for over uh, his 11, 11 days. And the ECMO continues, continues for 10 days. So this is X-ray and the CT scan images for him uh, before and after the ECMO implantation. So far, we have finished five cases, uh, five ECMO cases, and uh, four survived. Uh, just one die, died of the uh, cerebrovascular hemorrhage because um, uh, even after a very strict and anticoagulation, and but unfortunately he has a uh, complication of the bleeding. So four uh, cases are male and one female. Four cases is VBA ECMO and one VA ECMO. The average uh, age is 55.6 years, uh, ranging from 44 to 68. The died one, the, the, the death one is aged uh, 68. And duration, average duration of the ECMO support is 11 days. So this is the five cases we, uh, uh, we, we uh, went undergo, undergo the, underwent the ECMO uh, implication. So this first one, the first, the four cases is already discharged and uh, the, this is a non-survival. So, and uh, I, I I would point out that the the first two cases, uh, they were they uh, I mean to remove the uh, intubation first, uh, re remove the uh, ECMO first, and then ex expel him. So that means uh, these two uh, is not a weak ECMO. But for these three uh, cases, they remove the intubation first, and then win of the win of the uh, ECMO. So. For these three cases, they can they are awake during the uh, support of ECMO. So that's uh, that's what I want to uh, discuss is uh, is for those uh, for those patients who need the uh, ECMO implementation, I prefer to use the awake ECMO for him uh, because of the I mean, in our world, sixty four percent of the patient who cannot uh, expulsion after the invasive ventila ventilation. Uh, I don't mean that the uh, intubation is not good for those COVID-19, for those critical COVID-19 patients if they need a, a mechanical ventilation. I mean, for those uh, patients uh, who need a, a support of ECMO, uh, I mean, to use the ECMO uh, earlier may be much better to use it to use it later. So before they get a MODS, uh, the ECMO implementation can save their lives. So that's that's what I would like to share with you. And uh, I appreciate for uh, the help from the friends all over the world. And uh, we get a lot of helps and uh, guidance and instructions from overseas. And uh, appreciate for the, uh, the forgiveness for my family because I I, I, as Dr. Tan said, I was infected in January uh, 21 uh, after I did an ablation for a Takati patient. And uh, I got a fever and a cough and a fatigue uh, and lay, lie in bed for four days and uh, get a recover, a recovery. And then I returned to the world to take care of my patient. So I actually, it, it, during the epidemic of COVID-19, I was a uh, I was both a uh, patient and a doctors, so I know something 
that the general doctors who don't know, because uh, for those patients, I think they are the hero of my city because they fight against the uh, coronavirus with their body. And we fight against the coronavirus with our drugs, with our techniques, and uh, with all our efforts. So I think, uh, yeah, all of the world, the coronavirus are, is a very common enemy for all of us, for all of the world. So we should find, uh, stand together and have a hand to uh, overcome this crisis. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, Professor Zhou Ning. It was indeed a very remarkable lecture. It shows that you went through it, every part of uh, the COVID experience. And um, I, I think I'd like to congratulate uh, not just Wuhan, your hospital, the citizens of China, because they've shown the way for the world. You all had a huge search and I can see, and you can see clearly the data that the number of cases in China has really plateaued so that you can reopen uh, both uh, Wuhan as well as the provincial so congratulations. Um, I'd like to take a pause here to ask some Q&A before we move on to the links question. So we have quite a few questions popping up while Professor Zhong Zhou was uh, giving the lecture. So I'd like to group it a little bit and um, I'd like to start off with some question on medications first. So we are not experienced in, um, as far as I know, the summary is that none of the medication is really evidence-based. And China has some uh, experience with some traditional medicines. Uh, can I find out what traditional medicines? And there's also a question about your experience in hydroxychloroquine uh, in cardiac patients, whether they do harm patients more than help them. So maybe I'll start with Professor Zhou first, followed by Dr. Ling on this question. So uh, thank you for your question. So as to the antiviral drugs we use in our world, I uh, personally, I think the hydrochlor uh, hydrochlorine is mad help for those severe patients because I we tried some uh, tried these drugs in some patient and the, the uh, we already sent a medical script outside it is still un un under under review but our preliminary data showed that this uh, the hydrochlorine is help for those very severe patients it can decrease the mortality rate around thirty percent. So it's not it's unpublished. So I, I can't say that it, it, it is not for the peer review before the peer review. So uh, that's our raw data. I would like and to share. What, what do you what do you observe when you stop it for your cardiac patients? Do you what do you watch out for when you start hydroxychloroquine? Uh, we checked the uh, the the antibody and the the viral test. We did the viral test, and uh, uh, that means. Uh, compared with other antiviral drugs, the patient used the hydrochlorine, he has a much a much higher uh, change from the positive to the negative. And also, we, we test the concentration of the antibodies. They also showed a much uh, a better uh, result in the patient who received the treatment of hydrochlorine. So there's some viral, um, uh, uh, antiviral activity going on. Do you do an uh, ECG serially for this group of patients? Uh, yeah, yeah, we did ECG and the echo both. Okay, Dr. Ling, you have any comments about therapy-wise, uh, hydroxychloroquine? Yeah, so, so our experience with hydroxychloroquine really isn't that extensive because I think we started off at the beginning of the pandemic um, more in favor of uh, calitra and interferon. But having said that, right till today, we really do not have proven effective therapies, and the only reason why. Um, as an ID group, we collectively decided to use, and again, it's decision dependent. So not every ID doctor is going to go up there and prescribe Calitra or interferon or both to every single COVID patient they see. Yeah. So I have to say that our experience firstly was initially with Calitra and interferon. Have we seen um, fantastic outcomes? I really don't know. Okay. As in, I don't think um, they have, we've had patients that have done well but we've also had patients that deteriorated on clinitra and interferon, okay? So in NCID, our approach really is that if there's a clinical trial for antivirals, we would prefer for these patients to be recruited into the clinical trial first. Now, only if they are not eligible for clinical trial, then that's when we start discussing with patient 
the option of Calitra and interferon, especially if they are fairly early on in the disease process, so less than 12 days or so, because we had some data that had emerged from China, the recent uh, NEJM study that indicated that Calitra somehow didn't seem to have had significant benefit when compared to the placebo arm. And then hydroxychloroquine really, we've only started thinking about it a little bit more seriously in the past month, and we've only started prescribing it on a very ad hoc basis, again, very physician dependent over the past two weeks. So I really can't say very much about hydroxychloroquine, except that say the patient is not eligible for trial and it's already week two, week three of illness, and therefore we're thinking, well, Calitra interferon may not work anymore, then maybe we might consider hydroxychloroquine. But if the patient is very old and has got cardiac risk factors and the QTC you know, is a bit borderline, they may not even offer hydroxychloroquine. So our experience okay. with, is, is not uniform. That's all I can say. And yeah. uh, there are a lot of questions about therapy. So I think people ask about antibiotic. I think acetromycin has been tried in combination hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine. Yeah, we, we uh, There are comments about uh, yeah. convalescent plasma as well. So yeah. I, I think the summary is that all this are uh, not evidence-based. It's quite antidotal. The evidence so far is quite mixed. Uh, yeah. The recommendation so far is that you want to start this therapy, it should be discussed in patient and probably started as a protocol so you can collect data and show whether it's useful in the future, yeah. including some of this traditional Chinese medicine that has been tried and used uh, across China. I think we need much more data to show usefulness. I think we really don't know. I think what Dr. Zhou said is perfect. Beyond supportive therapy is Star Trek zone, I think uh, we're not sure. So I want to move on a little bit. Uh, there's this question popping out about, I saw in Dr. Cho's slide, hypertension patients uh, consist of 50% of this group of patients. Uh, and what is your advice? Should this group of patients stop their ACE inhibitor because there's some association with ACE inhibitor use ARB as an entrance uh, pathway for the COVID virus? I wonder whether Dr. Cho or Dr. Koji has any comments uh, or advice to the audience regarding hypertension and COVID? Dr. Cho uh, first. I have some kind of slide. Yeah, Dr. Koji, you want to share your slides? Is, possible? Yes. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, okay. So maybe just one or two slides on this topic. Yes, uh, just uh, because uh, I am representing the uh, cardiovascular pharmacotherapy uh, well, just I will speak about the, uh, briefly about the anti-hypertensive uh, uh, drug and uh, COVID-19. And you know, uh, as already Dr. Zhou uh, described, the hypertension is very common in COVID-19 patients. And also that the 48% of non-survivors had hypertension and 23% uh, of survivors had uh, hypertension. The odd ratio of hypertension for death is uh, more than three. And also in Europe, uh, it has been reported that uh, more than 70% of the uh, died patients have hypertension. So the, the hypertension is uh, very common in non survivors in COVID 19. So uh, maybe that the hypertension is also common in old high aged patient, but uh, let's go to the uh, hypothesis of the ACE2, uh, angiotensin combating enzyme 2, uh, which is actually the protective molecule, uh, but which it has been also shown that ACE2 serves as a receptor uh, for the uh, SARS coronavirus 2. And uh, also, uh, it is shown that the angiotensin combating enzyme inhibitors, ACE inhibitors, and angiotensin receptor blockers upregulate the expression of ACE2. So, uh, this fact led to the hypothesis that the patient receiving ACE inhibitor or ARB are more susceptible or uh, more uh, opportunity to be infected by SARS coronavirus too. So uh, there are a number of discussions for this hypothesis and against uh, for the, 
on this hypothesis. And for this hypothesis, the patient treated with S inhibitor or ALD may be at higher risk of COVID-19. And so that the calcium channel blockers could be a suitable alternative for the hypertension treatment. Uh, on the other hand, uh, at present, uh, it is unclear whether the hypothesis could be at, at applied to humans, therefore S inhibitor or ALD uh, should be continued as a, until further uh, data are available. But many societies uh, is against for this hypothesis, including ESC, AHA, ACC, and Heart Failure Society of America state that uh, that at present, there is no clinical or scientific evidence to suggest that treatment with ACE inhibitor or ALD should be discontinued uh, because of the COVID-19. But uh, very few data are available, but uh, one published uh, data is available on the use of ACE inhibitor and ALD. And the title of the uh, paper is uh, The Cardiovascular Implications of Fatal Outcome of Patient with uh, Coronavirus Disease 2019, COVID-19. And basically, uh, in this paper, uh, the elevated troponin T levels are associated with death. So uh, if the troponin is high, the mortality is around 60%. And if the troponin level is normal, the mortality is around 9%. And uh, with the use of S inhibitor or ALD, the high elevated uh, troponin is 21%. And the uh, normal troponin level, uh, the use of S inhibitor or ALD was 6%. This was a significant difference. T value is uh, 0.002. And also the mortality rate, uh, the use of S inhibitor or ARD was 37%. And if uh, the patient did not uh, uh, receive uh, these drugs, uh, the mortality is 26%. The, this difference is not significant. But uh, the uh, elevated troponin T levels uh, in patients receiving S inhibitor or ALB might be attributable to that the heart failure patient often receiving this drug. So at present, we are not sure uh, the elevation of the troponin T is attributable to the spe specific effect of S inhibitor or ALB or due to the uh, more often in uh, high heart failure patients are included in uh, elevated troponin T group. So this is a tentative conclusion, not uh, conclusive, just a hypothesis. At present, there's no clinical evidence to show that uh, S inhibitor uh, ARD uh, results in fatal outcome in COVID-19 patients. Uh, right now, the clinical trials are ongoing, but uh, uh, we cannot uh, rule out the possibility that these drugs will increase the uh, susceptibility or opportunity uh, to be infected by SARS coronavirus too. So, and also the hypertension or heart failure are also common in high age patients. So uh, these patients need to be carefully followed up on COVID-19. And the lastly, this is my personal perspective to be discussed. Uh, if the patient, uh, hypertensive patient is stable, uh, I would say just to consider to change S inhibitor or LD into other drugs. But the heart failure patient, and the apparently uh, there is a clear evidence that S inhibitors or LD are beneficial for heart in heart failure patients. So uh, at present, uh, uh, we should continue uh, uh, this agent. That is a personal perspective, uh, but uh, we need the further evidence for that. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Prof. Koji. That's very succinct. Uh, can I just uh, have a quick word from Dr. Zhou Ning? What is the practice in China? Do you switch the patients um, 
away from ARBs or ACE inhibitor? Yeah, that's a very controversial uh, topic. So uh, we never stopped the use of ARB or ACI for those hypertensive patient or the heart failure patient uh, uh, of the COVID-19 patient. So we still continue to use these drugs in the, in the COVID-19 patient. Yeah. So you, there's no change in practice. I think this is consistent with all the major societal guidelines that uh, I think the, the fear or this presumptive uh, change may cause more harm if the hypertensive patient are not well treated. So I'd like to take one more uh, bundle of questions before I move on to Dr. Ling's lecture, before I close up to address the other question. The next bundle, which I'll ask opinion from the faculty, especially Dr. Cho, is how to tackle the troponin T, B, and P and tying with, with ECMO use. For example, your patient um, clearly had troponin T as well as BMP rise and depressed LVEF. And in this group of patients, is the criteria more for BB ECMO to address the hypoxemia? or VA ECMO to address the cardiogenic component, noting that the pH was low, he was having high lactate, clearly he has some form of cardiogenic uh, collapse as well. So when do you decide on VV versus VA? Do you do troponin T or I for, as a routine for all cases? And only if positive, do the BMP or is it routine for all patients or only for the sick patients? Dr. Cho? Yeah, that's a very, very important, also very interesting problem. So before we did the uh, implementation of ECMO for the patient, absolutely we need to test the echo and the ECG and also the BMP chopolin uh, for him. So preferably, I use the VV ECMO for the COVID, very severe COVID-19 patient because for the COVID-19 patient, the, mo the, the biggest problem is the respiratory failure. That means hypoxemia. So most patients has a very severe hypoxemia caused by the respiratory failure, but not the, the heart problem. Oh, oh, of course, the heart problem is very important. But for those who has a respiratory failure and a heart failure, uh, evidenced by a very high BMP, a very significant uh, myocardial injury uh, as the, the troubling and the troubling I or troubling T increased very much, for those patients, we will we would to change into a VA ECMO. But for my patient, I have five cases, just one VA ECMO because his BMP is very high. It's over 10,000, over, over almost 1,000. Oh, no, 10,000, 10,000. So at that time, I would like to use the VA ECMO for, for our circulatory uh, support for the patient. But uh, as my, uh, according to my experience, VA ECMO may be better than VA ECMO for a very, a regular COVID-19 patient, yeah. So it's also easier to use uh, less mobility and uh, potentially you can consider a weight uh, 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 and then uh, exhibit this group of patients if the VBMO does uh, the oxygenation well for this group of patients, more comfortable for them as well. Um, so there's a lot of other questions uh, just to find my faculty. They are talking about what is considered adequate PPE for frontliners. China has a lot of experience and you have a lot of frontliners who are infected. And I think there's a lot of uh, myths out there about what is considered adequate PPE. This part I will probably get um, Dr. Ling as well as Dr. Zhou, as well as Dr. Lam to share their experience about what, what do you feel safe as a PPE for healthcare workers. So we'll start with Dr. Ho first. In Hong Kong, uh, what is a PPE that you think is adequate for healthcare workers? Yeah. Uh, regarding the PPE issue, I think there are many experts, uh, they will talk about that. Uh, maybe I mainly focus on the PPE in cat lab in this issue. For I've checked most of the PPE that we use in cat lab actually is a uh, level fee. Uh, suppose it's uh, water resistant, but this is just water resistant, it's not waterproof. If you uh, put some water over it, it's okay, and the water will not go in. However, if you have prolonged contact time with the blood during the PCI inside the lab, maybe in also in other clinical work, when you have prolonged contact time with liquid, actually water or blood can uh, cause your PPE. That is something you need to be very careful. Many of the time we take the PPE, go to do the PCI, and then after that, after the gun and then the uh, supporting staff will we found some butt on our apron. So be careful of that. Um, the PPE is level fee. 
prolonged contact of water, uh, liquid, it can diffuse inside your body. Uh, that is something uh, I recently found out. So for now, just to clarify, your PPE is a uh, N95 mask, uh, mask over your eyes, uh, full yeah, gown, and eyes, right? Yeah. Right. If we, do, or no? if we do suspect case, we will use N95 and face seal and uh, also a cover of the hair, everything. But not but a hazmat suit, right? Only a hazmat suit, just a gown. Mm -hmm. No, no waterproof gowns in Hong Kong. Just uh, no, so far no. Now uh, our strategy is try the best to avoid to do a PCI for confirmed the COVID case or suspected sure. case, try medical treatment uh, unless you can. Um, Dr. Joe, yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Joe, you want to share on the PPE in China for the frontline stuff? We can't hear you. Are you muted, Dr. Joe? Yeah. 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 yeah, but very similar to Dr. Lam uh, in Hong Kong, we use the uh, very very strict uh, the, uh, infection con control in the cath lab and also in the world. We actually, we just finished two cases of the uh, STEMI patient uh, with a COVID-19 patient in, in the cath lab because of the, the, the very severe condition because the patient have a cardiogenic shock. We did the thermolysis for him, but, um, but the, the uh, circulation is still very bad. So we have to choose the um, PCI for him. We don't have the negative pressure uh, case lab so far. So uh, just to reconstruct our case lab to, I mean, to, to, to prevent as much as we can to protect our uh, medical personnel working in the case lab, we close the AC, we, we close the AC, we, close, uh, we, we shut down the AC, we, we close the windows, the, the, the doors and seal them. And also we use uh, the, third, the third grade uh, protective method. That means that we, we use a protective suit we use the N95 mask and also with another uh, surgical mask covered with N95 and also the goggles, the, the, water, uh, the water proof the goggles and also the face shield. And then we cover every skin of the body. And, and, that, and in this case, I think we can uh, decrease the possibility to be infected as much as, as we can. But I don't think that uh, the regular PCI for the STEMI patient is a good choice for our cardiologist because we cannot uh, to make sure that the, uh, we cannot be infected in the cath lab because the cath lab is a very small room. It's, it's, I mean, the, 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 the airflow, the airflow is not so uh, fluent. So I don't think, I think that's a very high risk for us. Yeah, I, th I think uh, Dr. Holam previously shared also, uh, the problem across all cath lab is a positive pressure. I think China showed us some example where they did barriers at the exit to prevent it because actually the moment the door opens, everything is outside in the control room outside and the circulation yeah. you, you can't raise. Really. So I, I think uh, it's very tricky to do COVID positive patients. I think a lot of countries have moved on to thrombolysis if appropriate for the STEMI patients and only in hemodynamic unstable patients for the ACS patients do we uh, bring a COVID patients into the cath lab. There are a lot of repercussions for Can I just well. make a comment? Yes, uh, Dr. Koji. Yeah. Uh, many people are asking about the elevation of the uh, troponin level and also yes. myocardial injury. So uh, I, I just like to ask uh, Dr. Do, is it uh, very easy to differentiate uh, myocarditis and acute myocardial infarction due to uh, mm -hmm. coronary thrombus? Because in most mm -hmm. patients, um, the troponin uh, elevated and also some kind of uh, uh, change of electrocardiogram will occur. So it may be very difficult to uh, uh, differential diagnosis of uh, myocarditis and uh, acute myocardial infarction due to uh, coronary yeah, thrombus. Excellent question, uh, Prof. Uh, do you have, uh, any, you have any uh, answer to that one? Yeah, I feel yeah, I fully agree with uh, Dr. Kochi about the differentiation uh, of STEMI and the uh, increased troponin I or troponin T induced by the hypoxemia. Because, you know, that's very difficult for us to do the angiography uh, very emergently. So, 
uh, we used echo, we used ECG, and also we use other kind of the, the examination to differentiate uh, why the patient have a myocardial injury is due to the primary coronary heart disease or is just a secondary uh, phenomenon caused by the hypoxemia or the infections. So that's very difficult for us to differentiate. So it need to be a, need a very comprehensive uh, judgment. Do you see in those uh, troponin positive patients, ECG changes of pericarditis or ischemia or is it very non-specific? Uh, it's not very so common. <laughs> I mean, I mean, we we already finished the the analysis of the patient with a, a normal ECG when they has a very high troponin I, and uh, we found that around thirty percent, only thirty percent have a ST elevation, but most of them are ST depression. So, uh, you know, ST depression doesn't make many sense because the hypoxemia infections and the other kind of the, like a heart failure, some patient with heart failure can also have a ST uh, depression. But for those has ST elevation, we need also think uh, uh, furthermore, like is it a myocardial infarction or is it a myocarditis? You know, a lot of myocarditis can also have a ST elevation, especially for those my, uh, familiar myocarditis. You know, this patient is a inflammatory storm the inflammatory storm can also lead to a uh, myocarditis, especially for those very young patients, be very, very careful. If you find the ST elevation in a very young patient and the chipotle is extremely higher, so be careful, maybe it's a uh, familiar myocarditis because the differentiation of familiar myocarditis is very difficult, especially for those, you cannot tell whether it's a uh, myocarditis or whether it's a uh, it's, uh, coronary heart disease. That's very difficult to tell it. There's an interesting question from Alan Paul, Malaysia, addressed probably to Dr. Cho. So, you know, Wuhan now is lifted, is locked down. And of course, everyone is waiting to see whether COVID can get back to China again. What are the measures? For example, do you PCR test every case that come to your cardiology clinic or for elective PCI now or for elective surgery? Do you do routine tests for all patients who find procedures now, <laughs> even if they're well? Uh, that's very interesting. So, uh, so far we uh, we we already returned to our regular uh, clinical work. So, uh, at, that, at this time, for any patient who need to be admitted to in into our ward, they need to uh, be tested by the virus as well as the antibody before the admission. Uh, that's just for sure. They are not the asymptomatic infections. You know, some of the patient who actually is a virus carrier, and uh, this patient is also infectious. I don't know how infectious they are, but they are infectious. So to prevent the, uh, the spread of the virus, we need to be very, very careful to do as much as we can uh, for the virus test for, for those patients. And so China uh, yeah, that's also test, test, very test, important test, test. for the protection of the virus yeah. test as much as we can. So, so I know China function on test, 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 and I think uh, Po Lam tells me Hong Kong function on mask, 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 mask. Everyone must put on a mask as well. Um, Anna Ruka from uh, Thailand is asking about, just to clarify Dr. Cho, uh, positive pressure in the care flat, so you shut down the positive pressure and do full PPE before you do COVID patients. Do you turn off the positive pressure in the care flat? Before you do patients, COVID positive, Dr. Cho? Uh, you mean turn off what? The positive pressure in the cath lab. Do you shut it down? Sh shut it down, yes, shut it down. Okay, so you shut it down. Okay, good. Yes. Um, I think there's actually a lot of questions uh, that I think we'll just take one more from Dr. Kenneth Poor from Singapore asking, do we, should we do ECG in all patients who uh, under the swap and send home program. Uh, Dr. Ling, do you want to take that one? Should we do ECG for all the patients who require URTI, fibro, swap and go? No. I mean, we, of course we have to look at the patient. I mean, the quick answer is no. Okay, um, good. I like you, but you've got to look at the patient profile, right? If it's an elderly patient with multiple comorbids and, and if there is any evidence of cardiac symptoms, then yes. But if it is a young person, 
and quite a lot of our COVID patients in Singapore are, are fairly young without any comorbids, then there's no reason to do routine ECG just because they come in for acute respiratory symptoms. Yeah. But, uh, there's uh, this other side track uh, question. Any precautions to be used during yes, autopsy? Yes, can, I, can I have a one question? Yes, 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 please, uh, Prof. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you have, uh, is anybody have uh, data on the uh, antibody against the COVID-19? So many people will check the uh, COVID-19 PCR, but uh, Europe uh, or America are going to use the uh, antibody checking. Uh, so this is a good, great question, yeah. Dr. Ling, do you want to take that? Uh, what's the yeah. value of serology on top of so, Yeah, so, so far some of the, so we have done some testing and so to summarize, some of the findings that was found was that, uh, so for serologies, you've got IgM and IgG, okay? So for diagnostics, really, I don't think, this is what, this is um, our take on it. For diagnostics, meaning that to diagnose someone as a new COVID patient, especially if it seems to be within the first 14 days of symptoms, the serology has not performed very well the sensitivity ranges for IgG is less than 50%. For IgM is maybe about 80% towards the, towards the end of the two week. But if it is say um, beyond two weeks of symptoms, okay, and say your PCR is continuously negative, then there might be a role for serology because the IgG positivity beyond the 12 to the 14 days of illness rises quite significantly to close to about 100% sensitivity. So, okay. so to summarize it all, if it's very early on in disease within the first week, probably no point during serology, you're not going to get a positive result. And even if you didn't get a positive result, if you got a positive, good. If you got a negative, it doesn't exclude. Mm -hmm. But say if we fail to diagnose the fail to diagnose a patient with a positive PCR and is still symptomatic beyond two weeks or the clinical picture is very like COVID, as in PCR negative, got fever, CT shows nodules. It's two weeks of two weeks of symptoms, yes, proceed with the serology. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, in the future for places like Wuhan where there was high prevalence in the population, maybe beyond screening Hep B, HIV, they need a IgG COVID uh, antibody to come in safely back to the hospital for procedures. So um, I, I think we have a lot of questions, but I want to give some time to, for especially for the Singapore audience and whoever is interested in the Singapore data, for Dr. Ling to do her presentation, to share the Singapore experience and some of our cross-sharing in Singapore. Uh, Dr. Ling, uh, will you be okay to share your slides? Yep, okay, so I share my slides now, yeah? Hang on. The questions were coming fast and furious, so the Q&A yeah. took a bit longer, but uh, we will spend yeah. the, the next 10 minutes or so for Dr. Ling to just share across uh, the Singapore experience as well. Then we'll see whether there are any more questions that we can group together and uh, take. Um, and of course, my faculty, uh, Prof. Koji gave a lot of good questions. And uh, Ho Lam and uh, Dr. Cho, you can uh, discuss among ourselves as well as uh, Dr. Ling puts up the slide. I don't know why, but I cannot seem to find my slides. As in, no, we did a practice time, uh, session I'm yesterday. I'm going to take other questions first. Um, um, is, is there any difference? Do you, do you have any precaution when you do autopsy for the patients in China? This question was quite interesting and it popped up. I don't know whether Dr. Cho, you have uh, other patients uh, double back or they don't do autopsy on this group of patients who dies. Dr. Cho, um, are you muted or okay? Dr. Cho? Uh, excuse me. I can hear you right now. Uh, it's okay. Um, so I think Dr. Ling's uh, slides are up. We'll, we'll okay. get Dr. Ling to present this. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for your invitation. I'll try to go through these slides quick, as quickly as I can, can so that there's... Full screen sharing. Maybe you can go... Full screen full sharing. Screen. Uh, this is a PDF. Uh, oh, PDF, right? it's okay. It's all right. Is it is that is that okay? Let no, me that's go fine, that's fine, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so I'm just gonna um 
this is the outline of my talk today. We'll just um, give a brief uh, situational update of what's happening in Singapore. Um, some profile of a descriptive analysis of some of the profiles of cases that we've seen at NCID. Um, we'll also discuss a little bit about chest X-ray changes in some of the sicker patients, um, as well as viral shedding overall. I'll discuss a little bit also about the experience with Kalitra and Interferon that we've had so far. And then maybe just to describe the incidence of hypokalemia and some cardiac complications in the ICU patient. So I have to say it's fairly timely that we had that Singapore had NCID, the National Center for Infectious Diseases, built um, to help us manage um, our fight or battle against um, any pandemic. So it's really timely that we had this because this building really was officially opened only from September 2019 onwards. Okay, so very timely for this pandemic. Now, um, in terms of the facilities that we have, um, there is about 64 cohort beds with 100 isolation beds and 124 NEP beds, okay? Certainly, these are all scalable such that in the event that we need more beds, they could be double-decked, so two beds in a single room, to such that we may be able to accommodate more than 500 patients that needs to be isolated. Okay. Situational update, so this is updated as of 14th of April, um, up to that point in time, we had about, in total in Singapore, 3,252 cases, of which about 1,500 was admitted to NCID. The rest were admitted to various public hospitals, as well as a few private hospitals. In terms of age, the median age is around 35. Um, I think at this point in time, this median age has been brought down simply because of the fact that we've had um, dormitory workers um, the, there's been clusters of dormitory workers affected and a lot of these dormitory workers are fairly young. Their median age ranges between 20 to 40 thereabouts. Okay? And therefore, it's not surprising that our percentage of uh, males affected have also gone up to about 77%, okay, of which 82% are locally acquired. Now, um, looking at the number of patients that required ICU, so this is updated until 14th of April, about 2% required ICU, okay, and they stayed for a median of six days, and this was looking at 24 ICU, um, ICU patients. Um, symptom onset to ICU admission was about eight days. Symptom, um, symptom onset, meaning respiratory symptom onset to ICU admission was about eight days, okay. Symptom onset to oxygen requirement, so from nine days from respiratory symptoms to requiring oxygen was about nine days. What about the incidence of abnormal chest X-ray? So we looked at uh, um, the first 177 patients, um, about 3.4 on admission didn't have X-rays, but subsequently they did. So for these patients, the first chest X-ray, about two thirds initially had a normal X-ray. Okay, subsequently um, they did progress to abnormal X-ray. Now, in terms of how, what was the percentage of people that had normal or rather abnormal x-ray? I just wanted to point out that in the younger age groups, right, um, even when they needed oxygen or when they were in ICU, their very first chest x-ray, so say people in their 30s, 25% that required oxygen um, had only 25% had abnormal chest x-ray, okay? And 13% of our ICU patients in the younger age groups their very first chest x-ray was actually abnormal in only 13%. Okay? But subsequently, as, as their progression went on, yes, they developed abnormal chest x um, um, a, a higher percentage developed abnormal chest x-ray. But as you can see in the older age group, so in the 60s to the 70s, um, upon presentation, a much higher percentage had abnormal chest x-ray. So just wanted to point out that it is not uncommon that for some of our younger patients, when they have respiratory symptoms and they come in, they may actually have normal chest X-ray. But if your clinical suspicion is high, say they have mild thrombocytopenia or they've been living in a cluster of COVID patients, please do do the testing and do zero chest X-ray to, to monitor for progression. Now, this is uh, some data that is... Uh, 
that Barnaby Young and his group did. Barnaby is one of our ID consultants and the manuscript's been submitted for review. So he reviewed the first 100 Singapore patients with COVID who were symptomatic with or without chest x-ray changes and hypoxia. And if you look at fever, dyspnea, and sore throat, that was significant. So for those without pneumonia, on presentation, 60% um, had fever. On presentation, without pneumonia, 7% was dyspneic. Without pneumonia, 67% had sore throat. Okay? Comparing to when they had pneumonia, but without hypoxia, well, when they had pneumonia, a much higher percentage had fever, same with dyspnea, and the sore throat declined in percentage. And when they had hypoxia, the percentage of those with fever was significantly much higher, 95%, dyspnea, 40%, and the incidence of sore throat and rhinorrhea also dropped. And this difference in these percentages were significant. Now, so what were some of the predictors for severity um, for patients that would subsequently develop more severe COVID? So Poiseur Horn, uh, one of the intensivists at NCID did this review and he submitted it also for manuscript uh, review. He found that in ICU patients, um, so the people who tended to be more unwell, they tended to be older, on presentation, they tended to report dyspnea, and they also were found to have a lower SpO2 on presentation with higher neutrophil counts. And so what were some of the markers that would raise the alarm bells that if patients were of this particular category, there is a higher chance that they would develop disease progression with COVID? Well, in particular, if the age is more than 50, if they had chronic comorbidities, if they had symptoms such as dyspnea, um, low SpO2, chest x-ray with pneumonia, and if the CRP was greater than 60 and LDH greater than 550, lymphopenia, um, neutrophil count that was elevated, a bit of thrombocytopenia, um, elevated drop I. So I'm moving on to our treatment guidelines. So this was um, this was um, discussed and carved out by a group of ID doctors from various hospitals as well as key pharmacists. So the take home from our COVID treatment guidelines is that if patient is considered of a high risk of progressing to severe disease, but is currently not so severe, and it's early on in the days of illness, we will enroll in an RCT, a clinical trial first, okay? But failing which, if they're not eligible, then we'll consider them for Kalitra and in, with or without interferon, hydroxy or hydroxychloroquine, or we just observe. Okay. Now, if they had presented a little bit later and they were more than seven days from onset of illness, yes, we'll still try to enroll them in a clinical trial. But failing which, if they are not enrolled, we will do pretty much the same thing. Whether or not we offer convalescent plasma, well, plus minus. Now, if they're already in ICU with severe disease, then yes, we will try to still um, offer clinical trials, but we'll try to recruit them into the severe Gilead trial, whereby there's a 100% chance of getting remdesivir. Uh, we may consider convalescent plasma, but this has to be in a multidisciplinary discussion with ID immunologists and intensivists. It's certainly not treatment that we take um, casually. Um, now, if, there, if we feel that this is the second week and there's evidence that there's hyperinflammation syndrome, such as very high CRP, very high ferritin and high fevers, we may, we may firstly do an IL-6 level and consider offering tocilizumab. Again, discussed in a multidisciplinary setting. Now, we have had the most experience with Kalitra and interferon 1b for our initial first 100 cases. So Grace Hu, one of our pharmacists, looked at the first 43 cases and she, this is what she observed. Most of these patients, about well, 50%, were started on Kalitra within seven days of symptoms. About 40% was also an interferon, okay? The median duration of Kalitra therapy was around eight and a half days. The median number of doses of interferon 
was around three. Ideally, if the patient is able to tolerate it, we try to give them seven doses over a period of two weeks. In terms of adverse side effects experienced by the patients, mainly a lot of GI side effects, okay, as well as abnormal LFTs. Okay? Um, so what were the types of LFTs? As you can see, majority had just grade one LFT abnormality. So the ALT and AST is about 1.5 to two times upper limit of normal. A small, a small percentage had grade three or more. We're looking at more than five to 10 times upper limit of normal in terms of the LFTs, including bilirubin. So we even have had patients whereby the bilirubin went up to about 100 plus to 200 on Kalitra alone. And after we stopped Kalitra, the bilirubin just gradually came down over a period of a few days to a week. So next I'm gonna talk about um, COVID viral shedding and CT value. So this concept of cycle CT, cycle threshold value is such that, um, so Barnaby in his study, he found that at a threshold, at a CT threshold of 30 and higher, the amount of genomic sequences that could be sampled from a swab becomes almost negligible. So it almost implies that the patient is not infective, very little virus left, okay? So we certainly did or have observed that with zero CT values is that the higher it is, the better, fewer virus there, and it tends to rise with days of illness from dates of onset of symptoms, okay? And the rate of decline also varies with degree of illness severity, or the rate of, in of increase also uh, varies with degree of um, illness severity. So what we found was, as you can see here, three zero is the magic cutoff number. So if the CT value exceeds three zero, it tells us that the amount of virus is probably very, very negligible. And if we cultured it, we may not get anything, okay? And if we try to correlate that with whether or not the patient had pneumonia versus no pneumonia, or whether or not there was pneumonia with hypoxia, you will find that the patients with pneumonia by around the end of the first week of illness, their CT value, would have exceeded 30, meaning that they are probably not so infectious, okay, or the, maybe, or rather, it, very little virus left if we did the MP swabs. However, for people with pneumonia, without hypoxia, their CT value took a little while longer, um, up to about 10 days before it became higher than 30. Now, for those that had more severe illness with hypoxia, we can see that it took right up to 21 days and they still, some of them still had a CT value that was less than 30. Okay. So what does this mean for us in terms of uh, clinical interpretation and implications for us on the ground? So how we take this is that, how we interpret this is that usually um, at day 15, about 58% of our COVID patients with PCR are negative. So 58% could be discharged or de-isolated, okay? By day 28, 95% of our COVID patients would be PCR negative, and therefore 95% could be either be discharged or de-isolated from COVID wards. Okay, finally, last two slides. How about potassium? We have observed amongst ourselves quite a lot of low potassium in many of our patients, including the young ones. And, um, and when we talk about low potassium, a lot of them have potassium that's less than 3.5. And so you look at the percentages, the percentage of patients with potassium less than 3.5 ranges between around 29 to 60%, tends to occur at a high percentage with the older age groups, more than 60. We can't explain why. There's not a lot of nausea and vomiting with these patients. Some do have diarrhea, but the diarrhea is not significant and neither is it prolonged. So we really do not know why they have low potassium. And what about cardiac complications? So on the general ward, about 80% of our patients are very well. Um, um, cardiac complications are not are hardly seen actually on general ward patients, but in ICU, we probably see it the most. So personal communications with Poise Horn, one of our intensivists, whereby he looked at 50 ICU patients. Um, he tells me that out of this 50, two patients had atrial fibrillation, okay? Four patients were diagnosed with a non-STEMI and two patients were diagnosed with a type 2 MI, okay? 
Only five patients had a 2D echo done, of which their EF ranged between 40 to 60%. Okay. Um, and the range of trop I, if it was ever done, would be between 28 to 6,000, and this was only done in 17 patients. And if this was done, it would be done usually in the first week of ICU and when they're symptomatic. So chest pain or um, hypotension, for instance. Okay, I'm going to end here. This is the last slide. Um, a lot of the data that you see up there today is all collated and analyzed by these various um, colleagues from National Public Health and Epidemiology Unit at the NCID. I'd also like to thank Dr. Sean Vasu and Dr. Wang Chun Siong for, for the additional slides. And I'd like to cap off by, by saying that um, I definitely agree with Dr. So. You know, it is all about teamwork um, when it comes to battling the COVID infection. And we are so very grateful for the amount of support we've been getting from everyone in Singapore. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ling. Uh, that was fantastic. It was, uh... Better el uh, elaboration uh, compared to this morning's quick uh, teleconference with Professor Liu as well. So um, can I uh, say that we have maybe another 10 more minutes to go before I would like to close this session. Uh, I'd like to address um, most of the questions, especially those directed at Professor Cho, because I think he has to leave sharp at 1.30 for another engagement as well. Um, one quick question. Um, uh, do smokers have a more severe disease progression for filling on the petrol? It's a good time for anti-smoking campaign. Right? That's very interesting because uh, according to the, uh, the former observation, we don't think that the smoker is more susceptible and the most Please severe. don't say that. You should say they are susceptible. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and that data, you know, uh, should be scientific. <laughs> Yeah, yeah okay. theoretically, okay. theoretically, the, the smokers are maybe more susceptible to the uh, coronavirus, but we don't find any uh, very solid data to support that a smoker is more sus susceptible. So be, uh, be science. <laughs> uh, hopefully, we don't. So, the, the, so far, the hypertensive patient seems more susceptible than smokers. Mm. Professor Koji, uh, any comments to that or Olam? Yeah, uh, I'm very surprised to see the last slide of uh, Dr. Link that uh, out of 50, 50 patients, uh, six patients had a myocardial infection. It's very high percentage. And uh, mm. uh, how about uh, in China? Uh, do you have uh, so many experiences of myocardial infection in COVID-19 patients? And it's mm. very frequent and um, information may occur at the coronary artery, and uh, which caused the rupture of the uh, unstable plaque, which led to the thrombus. So, do you think that is a mechanism of the uh, acute myocardial infarction in COVID-19 patients? Mm. Dr. Zhou, you have any comments? Yeah, uh, what's the percentage uh, like in China? Yeah, just, yeah, just finished the raw data analysis yesterday. So our uh, percentage of the acute myocardial infarction uh, in the severe COVID-19 patient is around 1.3%. 1.3%, okay. Yeah, 1.3%. I think it's very high and uh, higher than the usual uh, percentage, even 1.3%. Mm. Yeah, so 1.3% of all the sick cases or all cases? 1.3% all, cases, all the cases in my hospital. We yeah. have uh, 1,400 severe COVID-19 patients in my hospital. How about the mm. this, uh, what percentage in the ICU patients? What is the percentage of uh, type 2 MI based on enzymes in the ICU group of patients? Mm. Yeah. Do you have data for that? We don't have very uh, exact data in the ICU board. Uh, uh, from February, from February 10 to uh, 31 March, we have four acute myocardial infarction patients in the ICU board. Uh, uh, during this time, we have over 70 percent, uh, 70 patient uh, monitored in the ICU. So four uh, plus four uh, four, 70. 70. Yes. Okay. That's okay. ICU board. Dr. Lam, you have any uh, data? Yeah, may I ask some question? Because I, I see Dr. Ling's uh, slide also uh, in Singapore. Uh, I think that maybe you also used hydroxychloroquine. 
Uh, may I ask Dr. Ling and Dr. Zhao, what is your experience uh, with the hydroxychloroquine? Do you think it worked? Uh, the drug hydroxychloroquine? Yeah, I have to say that uh, we've only started to use hydroxychloroquine in the past two weeks. So we do okay. not have, I do not really have enough experience to say that it works. Honestly, I think, I don't know if it's going to work. Dr. Zhou? I, yeah, as I said, I used hydrochloroquine in the ICU ward uh, during the past two months. It showed that uh, the hydrochloroquine might help for the severe or critical severe patient, but may not help in the mild patient. Mm. Actually, to tell you, I don't know. You see the treatment regimes. The way it's segregated, it seems as if people are saying um, you should start earlier rather than by the time they're sick. And I'm not too sure whether there's a lot of evidence backing which drug to start early versus late. And I, yeah. I think uh, there's a lot of questions here about treatment, convalescent plasma, the role of prophylactic, prophylaxis for COVID exposure. I don't think we have enough data to, you'll be opinionitis here, so I'm, I'm very hesitant to give more guidance on uh, therapy at the moment. I think we should focus. I, I think I would like to quickly uh, summarize and then get everyone to say one last words that we should focus on what we do know, which is that mm. it's really a pandemic. We do need to test, 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 and really isolate and quarantine the exposed uh, group to prevent further spread. So flattening the curve, like what China did, what Korea did, maintaining a low rate of infection, like what Hong Kong is doing, or what Taiwan is doing in these East Asian countries, is what everyone should be aiming for. We shouldn't have a doubling rate of two to three days like the US or parts of uh, Europe. That's the first thing. I think uh, previously, Holam keep talking about mass, mass, mass. So Singapore now is following mm. suit. When the prevalence rate is high in the community, everyone should be masked up, protect themselves. I think that's fair. I, I think the healthcare workers and community should band together to help with the effort. I think we are really frontline. And uh, because we're frontline, the adequate PPE and personal standards of care should be enforced. We should really take good care of not just ourselves, uh, but our patients uh, as well as a team. We, every time the rates of infection goes up, my fear is collateral damage for our cardiovascular patients. When the system is overwhelmed, I can't treat my AI patients, I can't treat my AMI patients well. So I would ask everyone to prevent more infections by watching out uh, for this group of patients so that we as cardiologists can continue to manage our patients. Before we jump on to oscillated mechanisms and, and um, treatment strategies like stopping ACE, ARB, I agree with Professor Koji, we should get more data first before it cause harm uh, by prematurely stopping proven efficacious uh, drugs or prematurely jumping on bandwagon to push for convalescent plasma and all this. Every treatment has risk, especially in some of the more elderly patients, I think some of the antivirals and hydroxychloroquine can potentially cause harm in our cardiovascular group of patients. So uh, with that, I'm going to go around and uh, get uh, everyone to summarize. We'll get uh, Professor Cho Ning to say something first before he leaves. Professor Cho? Yeah, mm, uh, sorry, because I have another webinar at uh, 1.30. No problem, so no uh, I'm so sorry for, for the, the, the um, because I, mm, yeah. Um, thank you so much for having me here, and uh, it's my great honor to share my experience. Is bad or is good or is bad? The, yeah, I, I, sh I mean, uh, the greatest concern of mine is to keep ourselves safe, right? So I hope everyone, uh, especially for your frontline uh, medical doctors like Dr. Ling, Dr. Ho, and uh, Dr. Koji, please be sure to keep yourself very safe and uh, be sure to to wear the, the N95 mask before you have a very close contact with uh, confirmed or highly suspected case, uh, cases. So that's very, very important. Uh, before you take care of the patient to pre protect yourself very, very well. That's what I want to say and want to share with you. Thank you so much. That's coming from Thank personal you. experience or someone who's recovered from COVID. Dr. Lambo, you want to uh, have a final word? Uh, uh... Actually, thank you, Jack. It's my honor to be here, and I'm very uh, thankful and grateful to learn from all the experts. And uh, yeah, very fruitful experience this time. Thank you.
Thank you. Dr. Ling, um, your concluding remarks. Nothing. Very grateful for this opportunity to actually share and learn with everyone. I've learned really so many things just by listening to your comments alone. I can, can only just echo Dr. To. That seems to be what I'm doing today, echoing what his, his sentiments. Um, yes, we have to protect ourselves. And I know somebody just recently reminded me that even if some, a patient is collapsing in front of you, do not rush in. Make sure that we have the correct protection. Make sure that we are properly protected put things on properly. It takes time to do that before we go in because as frontliners, you know, if we are down, it doesn't help, doesn't do anybody any favours at all. That's all. Professor Koji, your final concluding remarks. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for all. Uh, discussion was very nice and uh, China, congratulations for China already overcome the COVID-19. Now the other part, yes. the COVID-19 infection is increasing. So uh, we need to learn a lot from your variable experiences. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. So again, I'd um, uh, like to end by thanking all the callers. I think we had 5,000 uh, call-ins and uh, almost 450 stayed all the way to the end now. And uh, that's quite amazing. So you guys, uh, the faculty, as well as the presenter, Professor Cho, and Dr. Ling and, and uh, Professor Koji has done a wonderful job engaging the audience. So I'd like to thank my faculty, thank the participants, and again, uh, thank um, uh, Raj for collaborating with APSC and ICT to jointly organize this uh, educational webinar. We hope to do more useful webinars for the participants. So please uh, log in and give us a suggestion on how to improve on this webinar and the type of topics that you want us to focus on. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank uh, everyone. Keep safe. Mask up. Okay. <laughs> okay smoke now. <laughs> yeah, okay. So Beko is safe. Well, thank you very much, guys. Bye-bye. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.